Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Lina and Janne. Uh, so this is a fun panel because uh, it starts like an anecdote. So three lawyers and one engineer are on the stage. And the rest, we will see uh, how it, and if it is funny. So uh, please take a seat. And we already know a little bit about Henry, but uh, we don't know that much about you. So uh, Janne, you are an associate professor in University of Oslo. So tell me about your research and you are the engineer, aren't you? <coughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm the engineer. I, uh, at the University of Oslo, I work with security management, actually, within cybersecurity. Uh, but I have a very long career working on critical infrastructure protection, all the way back uh, to President Clinton and uh, his uh, uh, directive on critical infrastructure. So my background is... Uh, kind of multidisciplinary. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer uh, and I uh, am also economist and have a PhD in uh, information security back uh, to 2008-9. Yes. So uh, I've been working with uh, various uh, topics uh, both for the government and uh, part-time uh, also in, uh, in the private sector. And now I'm uh, uh, at the University of Oslo, teaching students, uh, Institute for Informatics. Uh, and I'm also, actually, I have a full-time uh, full position at the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate, where I uh, do uh, development of uh, regulation and audits in, within the cybersecurity field. Thanks. Quite, quite something. Yeah. <laughs> really, really cool uh, to have you here in the panel. Uh, Lina, you are a, an advisor, legal advisor, and also a candidate for a PhD degree. What is your field of uh, studies and uh, research? Yeah, so uh, hello first, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, one thing is that daily I'm uh, working on, on domestic law, advising on, on how cybersecurity and law in Estonia works. However, my research is more focusing actually on international law. So doing my PhD studies and work at the university where I also teach international law, I, how to say, I try to figure out why states are doing what they are doing when it comes to uh, cybersecurity and cyber defense. So um, um, mainly my focus area is our sweet, sweet Eastern neighbor, meaning that I am trying to figure out why Russia is doing in the United Nations uh, when it, uh, what it does when it comes to regulating cyberspace uh, and states' behavior in cyberspace, as international law is a wee bit different when, uh, than uh, domestic law, meaning it is a bit more vague. It is created by the states who themselves have to actually enforce it. So it is quite a complicated area in that sense, and there is often this kind of um, idea that, you know, when it comes to cyber, it is totally, totally different. However, my point most likely will be that, you know, if we look more broadly uh, how things are in international law, we just have to apply it to cyber as well, and we can actually uh, pretty well uh, explain things. So this is one side, and on the other hand, I'm also trying to look at more on the individual side, meaning international criminal law, uh, and how that applies to cyberspace, meaning when cyber is used to conduct most heinous crimes, we're talking about war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, how then international law applies there. Really, really interesting. So when when we would conclude, then your research is mostly about understanding what nations are doing on the field of cybersecurity and what Russia is trying to achieve in the regulation. Sort of, and, and how the law is actually made and what are the differences. Is, is there any specifics to cyber? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. One question right away to you, uh, Lina. Uh, when I mentioned uh, the question, perhaps we should uh, lower the bar of uh, criminal offenses and let, let the children get off the hook for 
criminal offenses in hacking, you made this gorgeous face of no to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask, what gave me away? Was it the eyebrows? Um, yes and no. Um, no from the part if we think about creating like actual separate norms or new uh, new criminal law norms, uh, saying that if you're underage, you're off the hook. In the sense that law in, in general, I dare say, is sort of agnostic towards like who you are in the sense if you, if you step over the line, you step over the line. Of course, there are this certain uh, exceptions, as you brought out as well. And, you know, under 14, you're not uh, capable of guilt. Uh, so under 14, they are anyway out of it. And then there are very specific cases, I don't know, um, let's say the mother killing a newborn, very specific, but there is a very specific reason for it because, you know, childbirth is, uh, is uh, causing high emotional distress. So there is this very strong reasoning why have this specific exception. Now, being just underage, I dare say, is not comparable to that or does not justify that uh, in order to, or, uh, you know, to have this kind of uh, separate criminal law norm. However, the thing that you also brought out, and where I'd say yes, is what we do in the, um, in the limits of existing law, meaning that the criminal law doesn't say that if you hack, you go to jail. It gives much broader scale of what can be done. Uh, and the judge, the, the law enforcement can always take it into account, meaning that we can approach the adolescent uh, or the juvenile offenders in a different way, meaning taking into account that, oh, they were sort of experimenting. They actually didn't mean necessarily very much harm. And the example that you brought that, you know, uh, that the, the youngster was actually sent uh, to internship. Uh, I think it is one of the good examples, and that's the thing. The state prosecutor's office is actually doing it. They don't want, nobody wants uh, people to go to jail or have uh, as many criminals and offenders uh, with, the, with the criminal record as possible. Instead, we actually do want that, you know, if there is, you know, a hint of talent... Uh, we want to use that. And the other thing is the, the idea of uh, restorative justice. Mm -hmm. If we can lead people to the right path, we should do it. Uh, but at the same time, the, the, the caveat here is that, you know, the consequences still should be in line with the harm caused. Meaning, regardless if you're 17 or 67, if you cause severe harm, there should be severe consequences. So, no, we shouldn't change the law. Yes, we should push for uh, reasonable sentencing and we should always look at what the person actually did. Yeah, uh, sentencing and, and the alternative options. So it wasn't that bad of a face after all. Okay, uh, question, uh, Jan. Uh, you published just this summer or last summer uh, a paper with your peers uh, where you analyzed uh, the practical impl Im like the practical perspective of uh, having those written security systems and the quality assurance systems and then uh, you were comparing what had actually been done mm. am i am i right uh, yes uh, we uh, we had uh, uh, data from uh, questionnaires on uh, security management and uh, it was also in addition collected data through uh, various services like for instance BitSight that crawl the internet and can read uh, out the kind of uh, status from the uh, internet side on uh, how technical security is implemented. Uh, how good is your endpoint security? Have you secured emails? Uh, what kind of uh, protocols are used. Uh, and uh, we did a correlation uh, analysis that which uh, showed that there were difficult to find any correlation between the two, uh, two uh, findings. So essentially, everybody sa said in their documentation, for example, that we use two-step verification, but in practice, when you tested it, there wasn't any. 
Yeah, but uh, the question is not uh, correct uh, regarding to the data that we actually collected, but uh, uh, there is a huge distance between the conceptual and the operational. So while you can quite uh, specifically measure uh, what kind of algorithms you use, if you ask a human to, to answer a question, it's, it's not that uh, specific. So that's one problem. And another uh, challenge is that since we measured this uh, from the internet side, it says nothing about what the, what the status is uh, within uh, the companies. So, um, but uh, we, I also do audits, so what I, I can also confirm what you said, that sometimes, not often, but sometimes, there are some uh, legacy systems or other systems in a huge uh, IT infrastructure that do not have two-factor uh, uh, two authentication implemented. So the way to deal with this is to separate it from the internet. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, yeah, this you can makes it you can also. use another technical yeah. control to to mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually, this leads me to a follow-up question. Uh, now, uh, do I understand correctly then that the, the issue is that sometimes the standard like ISO 27001 is uh, uh, followed to the letter, but the process of thinking has gone out of it. Yeah, well, you can you can make a lot of uh, nice documents stating, uh, for instance, a security policy for the company. It should actually be reviewed. It should be communicated to the board and the management. But it, there is no time. So time is a scarce resource. We do not have uh, enough time to do all the good thing we should do when the, when it comes to cybersecurity. There's a lack of personnel. It's a lack of money. A lack of resources. Mm -hmm. So the way to deal with this is named risk management. You have a budget, you have some resources, you, you do the risk management and you do the best as you can. Yeah, it's called risk management, not risk exclusion for a reason. Yeah. So, uh, Jan, if you allow me, I would now lead us to, to the AI part of uh, the, these, uh, these ethical questions. If, if we would talk about the wider scope of ethical issues with AI, uh, do you see as an engineer some wider issues there that we don't usually consider? Yes, I do. Uh, well, the main weakness are us, actually, because we trust this. Or the less you know, the easier it is to trust something. Um, because you don't know, you don't see all the, the risks. Um, it's also um, uh, about the data quality, where, how it works, transparency, which has been mentioned. But uh, what has not been in much focus is the energy usage. So I read in, uh, I think it was Brussels Times, uh, 12th of May, that uh, a, simp uh, a chat GPT-3 search uh, used 25 times as much uh, energy as a regular Google search. So um, this is uh, not in line with the United Nations uh, sustainability objectives. And also when it comes to water usage, uh, 20 to 50 queries, there are studies that document that, uh, use uh, about a half bottle of uh, water. And fresh water is a scarce uh, resource on Earth. So we have actually quite a wider perspective to look at uh, energy, water, but uh, the biggest weakness is the person, the user themselves. Yeah, because we are driving the uh, uh, usage with, without thinking about the consequences. Uh, we always, we, we love to design new uh, software and uh, new things, but um, uh, when you do innovation, you do not, uh, you don't, do not think about what are the 
uh, bad side of what you're doing? Uh, or are there any uh, side effects that you should actually omit or handle in some way? Mm. Thank you. About the human uh, using the machine, Henry, a uh, question to you, like, s you partially touched upon this topic, but I'm going to poke a little bit more. So, uh, you said, read the terms, but these documents are tw 10, 20 pages long. Would you trust the AI to read the terms and uh, make a summary for yourself? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question because I, I don't really believe that anyone bothers to read them and uh, <laughs> myself, I don't also much want to read them if I'm not doing anything serious. But uh, my recommendation here, it, it's a fact that if you would put a whatever contract or if you would put ChatGPT's terms into ChatGPT and tell ChatGPT, dear ChatGPT, uh, Red flag to me the most serious parts of it, or which are the most risk riskiest, then it will do it. But uh, there is a conflict of interest because ChatGPT is reading its own terms. So if I would do it, I would recommend to use another AI tool to do it. <laughs> so don't let the same AI tool read your terms, which terms you are trying to read, because then you do not have the conflict of interest behind it. So conflict of interest. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't trust it completely. For ex of course, if you're doing it for your personal stuff, then it's then then the risk is is not really high. But if you are taking a company-wide decision that now we are starting to use this AI tool for that stuff, and if anything goes wrong, we are uh, in, in in a bad situation, then I would really advise to read it yourself, or include the legal team. Of course, then you can you know get some quality results from getting uh, from reading it thank you lena what do you lena has a yeah i would actually regarding trust i have a um, a bit different example but the, the thing that do you trust the results of for example chatgpt or whatever or, uh, some uh, some other uh, version uh, in academic work uh, i have tried i think at least twice maybe even more to ask uh, ChatGPT did, uh, you know, give me a list of 10 best articles in topic X, for example. And then it generates me an answer. It really looks like, you know, hmm, this author, yeah, I think I have heard that name. And this uh, title, it sounds like really relevant to this topic. And then when you go to the actual databases, and it even provides you like journals and publishing time and everything, when you actually go to look for those, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are just taken possible uh, names. Even some are made up, but they sound very similar to the existing names. And it is created. So it's a language model. Sounds mm -hmm. like a like the Estonian site telegram.de. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, you want yeah, to Yeah, well, uh, what, uh, I'm going back to the competences because what, what's, the, what's the problem here? The problem is that we don't understand how ChatGPT works. It's actually just statistics. It's picking text which statistically fits together. It's impossible to search the whole internet, so it has to do some choices. Uh, my husband, he's a chief engineer on a ship, and uh, he, we made a test. His neighbor, he was good at uh, using ChatGPT, so he uh, asked ChatGPT to make a manual, technical manual for the engine. It was useless. It was just the same as you, uh, you said. So uh, uh, the, when we start to use uh, services and products that we actually do not understand how they operate or how, how they come to the conclusion, it might have really serious consequences. And you can imagine if this was used within the medical services or within critical infrastructure, could mm -hmm. be serious consequences. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this actually, uh, these are very relevant problems and these are actually the problems that the new European Union AI Act is trying to figure out. 
it says that some AI systems will be high-risk systems, for example, systems used in, in medical field or in critical infrastructure. And there will be you know, lots of obligations for the developers of these kind of systems and some obligations also for the users of these systems, to, uh, not to ensure fully, but help to mitigate these problems that we have with AI. And it also, it also addresses the question of the black box problem. You know, AI is like a bowl of soup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a black box. And, and for example, ChatGPT uh, will have an obligation uh, to have a transparency policy to explain uh, why it does what it does and also have a copyright policy so it wouldn't just, uh, uh, wouldn't just copy stuff in all places of the internet and uh, then infringe those IP rights. Mm. Mm -hmm. But let's bring this, uh, this discussion to a next level and let's escalate. Right now the problem seems to be a good problem Namely, that uh, the AI is stupid, uh, not able to fully do its work. Uh, but let's imagine that we are in the territory of uh, Skynet in, uh, in the movie, Terminator movies, and uh, the AI has become self-aware and making decisions and so forth. Lena, uh, what do you think from, from the perspective of international law specifically? Uh, would you see then see the system in a way that the AI becomes a separate uh, like entity in the legal system, like a separate agent or, or not, not no longer simply under one state, but something different. Mm -hmm. I must say, uh, Reiner gave us the caveat that we should not fall into deep legal discussions and now he's ah, setting ah, up ah. a total rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, but I will uh, keep my dis distance from that rabbit hole. Um, one thing is that, you know, law, in, including international law, it is created by humans and, after all, for humans. States are also consisting of physical people uh, behind them making decisions, even though we say state responsibility, are still, uh, are still people. Uh, so you have the possibility to actually enforce it somehow. So the question is, uh, for me, wh where I started... Uh, how to say, uh, lean towards is the, is the question of like responsibility uh, and can, could we in that case actually enforce it somehow towards that uh, actual disruptive uh, full artificial intelligence. Um, and that leads to the question of like, okay, we can give it some rights, some obligations, maybe it's capable of like fulfilling those, but then it's, does it have the sense of fear of punishment? And how could we punish? Okay, let's imagine termination. Does it fear termination in that sense? If it would, then, you know, maybe the, like more broadly, I would say that perhaps it could be an actor anti international law because we have created other actors than states uh, under international international organizations, uh, legal, uh, legal persons have some kind of status. Um, so it would be possible because, you know, basically law is a language and we can describe anything with a language, right? Uh, however, the thing is, is it effective and what do we gain from it? Well put, well put. Uh, to say, to, to continue on that front of escalation, Jan, uh, you as an engineer, uh, how do you see it? This is perhaps a <laughs> theological question even. So if uh, the humankind created AI, then the humankind is kind of a god to the AI. But what do you think if we have a self-aware AI, does it agree with the laws written by men? Does it have to? Well, there is a very simple solution to get rid of the AI, and that's the power outage. <laughs> it doesn't work without power. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, if you compare the human brain, and uh, you have a, a picture with a number two, gray, white, uh, uh, black colors, uh, you, in a, a second or less, you can read that this is number two. If you use machine learning, it's to over over thousand, thousand uh, parameters that should be calculated. 
So when you looked into a generative AI, uh, AI uh, that I interpret we are actually talking about here, not machine learning, which is simpler, easier to, to control, uh, it is a huge amount of energy usage needed to calculate. And um, it's another point is that what, what kind of data is used? It is the historical data, data that already exists, right? It's not, it's not the creativity that lay, lays in the future. Uh, it has also, um, uh, it does not uh, also take into account outliers. It's statistics. It, that it builds on so far. It's, the, it's computer co processing. It was enabled by uh, the higher uh, internet capacity, broadband, and also the processor uh, capacity. That enabled us to, 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 to do a, a huge data uh, analysis that provides us with information. So, I really don't believe in uh, AI outcompeting the humans, but of course, if we leave more and more of what we actually think and do, we might become stu more stupid. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's the, actually the way I see it as well. Uh, I get the question about uh, will, uh, will uh, law lawyers be substituted by AI soon, any soon? My answer usually is uh, AI will make lawyers stronger, but I guess it's with, with anything. Uh, if uh, used correctly, it will make you better, but yet at the end of the day, today and 20 years from now, it will still be a tool. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's uh, make the line. Yeah. yeah, and um, you mentioned something very important. AI is useful uh, for uh, purposes which is meant to be used for. Uh, if you think that you can use it for anything, it's it's the wrong concept. Mm, I agree with you. Uh, and to give uh, Henry also the chance with the escalation of a self-aware AI. Uh, Henry, say you are negotiating a contract with a self-aware uh, AI and you agree on something. You shake hands with AI on something. What do you think? Do you uh, believe that the self-aware AI also believes in the principle that a contract should be honored? Um, it's a tricky question because when AI would be just like a lines of zeros and ones and we would do whatever a human has sold it to do, like a regular computer program, then most likely it would follow the principle that contracts should be fulfilled. But uh, if AI is generative and AI is learning from what is going on in the world, then the AI will also understand that it's, uh, you know, it's quite okay to infringe a contract once in a while. You will go to the court and, you know, it will take time and sometimes contracts um, are infringed. So I think it will... I think it will infringe a contract if it thinks it's the best outcome. And maybe it's even the strategy of that AI, self-aware AI, AI, to agree on that contract and agree on those clauses. And maybe the AI already knows that it will infringe it. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a mystified world. So you would trust it as much as any other human being you don't know? In a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. So we have uh, one uh, question which is quite hard, and I guess uh, it will be directed at Lina. So, according to uh, uh, international law, what offensive uh, cyber tools uh, can we build to build a deterrence against uh, Russia, China, and Iran? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> well, in broad sense, the logic is that there is the Mortens Clause, so basically it says, uh, in, in simple terms, is that, you know, regardless of the means that we are using, we ought to still apply the same rules that we have and follow still 
in case of, for example, international humanitarian law, which, which becomes uh, relevant when we talk about the, the context of, uh, of armed conflict. Um, so regardless of, of like whether we are using knives and, and forks, uh, automated weapons or cyber means, we still ought to follow uh, the same principles uh, of warfare. We still have to allocate those rules to uh, uh, then um, uh, weapons control treaties if there are such in place. Uh, and the assessment of weapons, whether they are acceptable under international law. So, in principle, weapons have to go through certain assessment. Of course, it is a bit open to discussion how do we apply it to, to cyber means, but in principle, we actually have those. I don't have the answer, like, what kind of specific. The, rather, the point is that whatever we create, we have to assess whether they are ethical under international law rules that already exist. We have to go through that assessment. For example, they should uh, not be indiscriminative, meaning that you, know, you have to be able to actually attack specific targets, but not everyone in the room or in the area, for example. So we should be creative, but we should follow the rules. Yeah. Good. Uh, the time is now zero, zero. Zero, zero. So thank you very much, uh, Jan, Elina, and Henry. Uh, was a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.